What he laid out is very important, and it's the demystification of this whole situation, which is that just, I mean, Stu didn't really say it. Say it. I mean, he did say it, but he didn't say it, he didn't say it as um, um, explicitly as I'm going to say. Explicitly. Explicit, no, explicitly. Oh, okay. Which is, it's all bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> it's all you're going to get is bullshit. You know, and it's all polit It's all blah 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 blah. You go on ideology. It's ideology and it's bullshit. It's and the people running the system know how the system works, and they run it this way. The problem is that it's not being directed for what, it, what it's supposed to do. And when it is, there's not a problem. When, it, when it's not, then all kinds of problems come in. Cri criminality and corruption and everything Speculation. else. Speculation. Huh? Speculation. Speculation and, and so forth. So, so you should, we're going to need to do that later another time. Uh, do, do this again because I think I think he's, the demystification of all of this is important because that's what you run into in the population. It's just it's just insanity, just or not just in the population, but the experts. You know. Okay. So I'm going to get going. Uh, I'm going to make this uh, rather rather quick. No, that's okay. 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 Uh, so I want to deal with some of the confusing confusion surrounding the schizophrenia that you're witnessing in policy going on, especially with the United States, but also it's in the empire as well. But to go deeper as well into what is shaping the world. Okay, and if you look at the Venezuelan situation, you have Pence, Bolton, and Pompeo going on this anti-socialist, anti-communist crusade. And you know, you're wondering, Wait a second, isn't communism dead? <laughs> isn't, isn't all this stuff dead? I mean, who, who really believes in that crap anymore? <laughs> and, they're having, and, they're, and they're going to war against it. And, and, not, and not just Venezuela. We're going to go to Nicaragua. We're going to go to Cuba. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and on and on and on. And you're looking at these people, and they have all these psychotic Cuban exiles in Florida who have a worse problem with the ca Castro then the Southern Confederacy had with the Lost Cause. You know? <laughs> I mean, they're like rabbits beyond, beyond the worst KKKers were. <laughs> I mean, I mean you, may, you know, this poor, this, 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 uh, this, a bunch of old guys were recruited by this guy, at, uh, Rai somebody, a, a rock, rock musician, into something called the Buena Vista Social Club. Out of Cuba, these are like old, beaten down musicians who got together and they they knew how to play Cuban music pretty good. They brought them to Miami and they were riots. <laughs> That's how bad it is. Okay, so and they seem to be doing it for a number of, of, of directions. So so you have two levels on this. You have the level of people like Pompeo and Bolton and Pence. But then you have the higher British level, which is manipulating it, which is using it. So, they, so one, they claim that it's, it's to stop China. In other words, Pompeo and all these people, are, are, it's not just the communism. They're saying they're stopping communist China and the Belt and Road from it coming into our hemisphere. And Russia is still communist, by the way. They don't, they don't, <laughs> they haven't figured out that, that Putin is it's more conservative than they are. Yes. <laughs> they haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> They're still in the old, 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 whatever. Mindset. Mindset. And, and uh, so, so, and then it's the Belt and Road that they're trying to stop. And another level, of course, is there's this racist vision towards the ghost of Fidel Castro, whom they, who they, rec who they think is, was reincarnated in, in uh, Chavez and Maduro. Uh, and they are originally fixed in the mentality of kill a commie for mommy. And that's like, goes back to their parents and goes back, to, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a rabid kind of ideological, uh, almost religious belief uh, system, structure. And these are the people 
These are the best people that Trump can find because the, because the neoliberals are worse. <laughs>
Why? Because he's not going to get reelected if he doesn't deliver on economic development. He's very pragmatic in this sense. He, he understands you unless he delivers to the working class that he promised that they would increase their employment and, 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 and have work, then he's not going to come back. He's very pragmatic. This is very businesslike. Very simple. So he has to deliver, and to deliver, he has to make it a change in his understanding between the Chinese. Because what had happened in the past is the Wall Street and London said, okay, you guys in China, you can produce this stuff a lot cheaper, and we'll throw these people out of work, and, and we can loot you and loot the Americans at the same time. <laughs> but the Chinese managed to get around that. And now, they have all this currency reserves, but what's the problem? The, the problem is, it doesn't work. And Ch Trump isn't blaming China. China's not the enemy as far as Trump is concerned. Wall Street and London are the enemy because they control the, the political establishment of the United States, which allowed this to happen. It wasn't China that imposed this on the United States. It was this international crowd that imposed it upon the United States. So, so Trump seems to be pretty clear on that. The, but the other people in there are not clear at all. They're, they're like insane. So, uh, so you have these two paradigms going on simultaneously in the in the U.S. Uh, government. Now, um, the, I was reading Vladimir Putin's speech, or I was skimming it and, and reading it, and and you know, there's a lot of stuff on the military and you know, the weapon systems and stuff like that. But then I, I came to the part on the economy, and I was quite shocked. Uh, he, he decided... Okay. Remember we were okay. going to do that? Okay, sorry. <laughs> he decided, what he said is this, and I'm going to paraphrase it. He said, he, he, this is the beginning of the speech, he said, you know, I want to... Uh, you know, the first part of the speech is about, about getting family size bigger. That was number one priority is population increase. That's number one priority in his speech. The first thing is we got to expand human reproduction, period. <laughs> because, because otherwise we're not going to be around, you know. And, and so this is very serious to me. Now, what he says is he, he wants to address Russia's economic, quote, systemic economic problems. And he, and he goes through four things, and, and so this is very interesting. He wants faster growth in what? Labor productivity. Labor productivity, does that mean by speed up? Speeding up the labor force? No. He wants to increase labor productivity based on new technologies, incorporating digitalization or more advanced computers into the technologies, and Development of competitive industries, industries that can compete on the international scale for exporting manufactured, quality manufactured goods. And he wants to increase in non-primary exports by more than 50% in the next six years. What are non-primary exports? Non-oil, agriculture, you know, non-primary exports, raw materials, etc. What is it? That's how you transform the labor force. This is this is Hamilton's development of manufacturers, and this is a okay. And this is a restructuring of the economy to more labor value exports in the context of the Belt and Road. Because how where is the where are the new products going? To, the expanded products going to go to? They're going to go into the development of other countries and so forth. Second, he wants to improve the business climate and the quality of national jurisdiction reliability with gross, in, he wants uh, investment to increase by 6 to 7 percent in 2020. Now, further on in the presentation, he says something very much akin to what, what Stu was laying out. And I, I was kind of shocked when you laid out this whole thing about the growth of the tax codes and the laws and everything else like that. So, at the regional, local level, there's a growth of this law and that law and this thing and that thing. At the federal level, is a, as some of it goes back to the time of the czar, <laughs> it's, it's this huge, huge undergrowth of regulations and its complexities and what have you. This is what he's calling for. 
On January 1st, all laws are abolished. All these laws are abolished. And we all, they only keep the ones which we need. And, a few, and we'll add a few to, to those. Oh, tax. Huh? Tax laws. Everything. Regulations. Regulations, tax laws, everything. So he's going to transform, because it's become too cumbersome. So he's, he's going to streamline the whole thing. He has to. He's going to replace it. He has to do that. But rather than replace it piecemeal, it, it's not possible. Just wipe it all out. <laughs> so I'm over reading this, and, and I'm going, whoa! Nobody's talking about this. Nobody's talking about this. This is big. This is big. This is big. <laughs> this is huge. But, you know, he has to do something. Because he has to create an environment where foreign investors can come in and make an investment and know that they're they're not going to get uh, you know all these <laughs> all these problems, right? Okay, three, removing infrastructural constraints. And what does he mean by that? He means you can't have this huge country with all these people with the with the population that they have with all. This distance, unless you can connect it up properly with a proper appropriate infrastructure, and so he's talking about bridges, rails, uh, highways, and everything else like that. And this massive infrastructure development, which Putin states, will create, among other things, an incredible internal demand for manufacturing. So it's not just manufacturing for export; it's manufacturing for building the infrastructure. So you're building up Ru Russian industrial capabilities, Russian manufacturing capabilities, processing of raw material capabilities for the purpose of the internal development of, of Russia. This is what China's been doing. This is, the, this is very important. Infrastructure leading the way for the development of, and then those, and the last thing he says, training modern personnel and creating powerful scientific and technological foundations. Okay, that's a platform. He's talking about raising the platform of science and technology component, but the key is his emphasis on what? The development of the power of labor. This is key. Where have you heard this? Extensively. The development of the power of labor. So, I wrote I wrote a, a, a memo to our group uh, to our leadership about this, saying this is an echo of Rouge in Putin's presentation, but it's also being echoed in China and it's also being echoed in India. So we have this whole echo of this kind of thinking. What is this? Is this kind? Is this green? No. What are they talking about exporting? Nuclear power plants. That's what Russia is talking about, exporting nuclear power plants. It's going to be their major export. Nuclear power plants. That's not green. So what are they, what, so it's a, it's a different mindset. Okay? So, and I, we picked this up, I picked this up at, uh, at a luncheon where the High Commissioner of India was speaking, from India here, was speaking on the new, on the new India. It's very similar. It's very similar. They're going to leapfrog scientifically, technologically, industrially in this manner. India. India, one of the most backward, long-term backward countries, the, screwed by the British. They missed the first industrial revolution. They missed the second industrial revolution. Now they're going for the third industrial revolution and the first and the second all at once. Combined. Combined. Both and people... People don't realize this is what Modi's doing, and they're they're all you know, you know, human rights and all of this stuff, right? They don't realize that's what he's doing. And the biggest problem the Indians have, and this is similar, to, this is an Indian situation, is how do you create a banking system? Because India did not have a, does not have a bank, did not have a banking system. It was all the 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 black market and the and the cash economy was, and I talked to this, I, afterwards I went up to the, to the High Commission and discussed this with them, that the, the, the black, the cash economy 
it's out there, and the money, and all the money that the, the state goes, it goes out there, but it doesn't, it wasn't coming back into the bank, so it couldn't be used by the bank. So that's the big fight in India is to create a. Uh, so when when they canceled all the top of bills that you heard, and everybody was screaming, "Oh, this is terrible! This is an attack on free market!" and blah blah blah. No, they're trying to create a banking system. And what they and so Modi gets up there and says. We want everyone to have a bank account, especially all the poor people. Well, what's he, why, why do poor people need to have a bank account? They don't have any money. What are they going to put? No, we'll give them money to put in the bank because we want to get them into the habit of, of using the bank. So, so, now, uh, so now, you know, 137 million new bank accounts have gone. Have, 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 uh, the bank account comes with um, employment insurance and overdraft as well. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so this is what they're trying to do. That's it. No more printing. No more nothing. Yeah, and also you can do everything with your cell phone. And there's 1.5, 1 billion cell phones now in, in India. So this whole thing is shifting, and it's fast. It's going fast. <laughs> and they're growing at a faster rate than any other country. So, so what's going on here? This is a different world. This is a different mindset. So, um, so. Now, this goes completely against the systemically flawed system of uh, old system, and the emerging hegemony of this kind, these kind of ideas across Eurasia, has a dampening effect on the ability of the empire to trigger hotspots in, in those areas. So that's partly why I'm saying they're going to Venezuela and places like that, because what's the issue they're trying to do? They're trying to establish the pretext for, um, and then uh, an anti. Sovereignty situation. It doesn't matter how bad Maduro is. The, problem, the issue is the sovereignty of, of Venezuela. You that is comes first, and you have to maintain that at all at all costs. And that's so. What the Russians have done is they've organized 50 countries to go against this, but not from the standpoint of defending Venezuela, but from the standpoint of defending the sovereignty of nations, and that a process has to be deliberative. There has to be negotiations. There has to be discussions. Things have to be resolved without a military intervention. So the Russians, have, that's just 50 countries. I don't know who they all are, but I'm not sure Mexico and a whole bunch of other ones are, are in that. So now, so I'm going to shift now to another crazy thing that went on under uh, under uh, Pence and, and, these, and these people. Is, is, uh, you had the uh, vice president of the United States at Munich, and you had the um, um, the, the defense secretary from Britain, a uh, young guy, uh, Gavin Williams. They were totally uh, rabid against Russia. And they told Germany that Germany had to give up uh, its, its connection to Nord Stream 2. <coughs> and for, for sheer, sheer economic reasons, Germany said no. So Germany just said no to a demand from these people to give up Nord Stream. Now the way the way the way Trump is planning is, oh, you want Nord Stream? Fine. Well, we're gonna we're gonna eliminate NATO protection. It's not it's not the same response as as Pompeo and all these people. And he's saying, okay, well, you can find you can fund your own defense. You know, if you want if you want to go to Nord Stream. So he's twisting it in this sort of way. It's, it's different. So, so now you have the the inter, uh, the abolishment of the inter, in, um, the uh, intermediate uh, missile treaty, and so now the European countries are for forced with faced with the following: they're going to have uh, intermediate missiles placed in their in their uh, on their in their countries that can hit Russia within twelve minutes or six minutes or whatever. Do they want those missiles there? No. No, they don't want the missiles there. They're, none of these countries really believe Russia is the issue. None of these countries believe Russia is going to invade. I mean, nobody believes that in Europe. You know, they all know. Yeah, I mean, they know the Russians. You know, but you know, the European Union and the bureaucracy and you know and the British and. And, and the toadies all have to maintain the line. They have to pl maintain the line, right? So, no, we don't want the missiles. Well, you're going you're gonna to have to have the missiles or else. 
So forcing a country to accept the missiles that they don't want is a form of bullying and badgering them into submission. So it's not, so the secondary feature of the missiles is not about just nuking Russia, it's about keeping Europe under control. Keeping Europe under control. So if you don't accept the missiles, then you're, you're a forcing, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a, 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 a mafia tactic. It's right? extortion. It's extortion. Yeah, it's what it is. So, so what's the issue? The issue is in Russia. The issue is Europe's economic future lies in integrating their industrial capability to the development of Eurasia. That is their only, that's their only future. They don't have a future also. And everyone who's, who's the same businessman in Germany and knows this. But you've got to deal with this problem of the British and the U.S. military industrial complex and all of that. So this is where we are. And this has come to a head. And now there's an eruption among Europeans saying, let's end the sanctions with Russia. Let's, let's get trade going. Look, let's have, let's have one integrated economy from the Atlantic to the Pacific. But you're great. You're old to the And everyone is, I got saying, so this is going on in, 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 uh, in Europe. There's, a, there's this whole process going on. Because, and, and then that's intersected by the green situation. The green New Deal in the U.S. and the, and the, and the carbon and what you were talking about is all intersecting this because that's what's being now thrown against all of that. And uh, so now, so we have two institutions which are uh, extremely problematic. That even if the empire were to go down, they would still be a problem. <laughs> One is the, the military-industrial complex. The problem with the military-industrial complex is: would it take orders from the empire to stand down? No. Because it was created for this purpose. And if this is not going to be the purpose for which it was created, then what is the purpose for it to exist? It does, has no purpose to exist. Therefore, the people that are in it have no purpose to exist. So there is an existential crisis within the US military, within the intelligence community, within the, uh, 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 all of the various aspects of this. So. The second institution where this is a big problem is the FBI. The Federal Bureau of Investigation is the protector of Wall Street, the protector of the city of London, the protector of the drug trade, the protector of organized criminal associations. They're there to make sure that the local law enforcement doesn't get in the way of what's going on. That's why the FBI exists. It's also there to police the political system, to frame up and blackmail politicians who get out of line, right? And they're going after Trump because he is a politician who's gotten out of line, and therefore they have to go after Trump. And this, then that's all that they know, and that is the, that is the FBI and the Justice Department and so forth. Now, why are all these Democrats doing the same thing? Why are they going after Trump in the same way that the FBI is? Well, because probably most of them are FBI informants when they were younger and, and they were part of the FBI apparatus and that's how they were, were, were vetted up, up the system and so forth and so on. And I'm, 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 I'm hypothesizing, but I wouldn't be surprised because <laughs> that's how... They kept the Communist Party going for a long time. Yeah, they kept the Communist Party going for a long time. So, so this has also come to a head with the direct uh, revelations of, of Andrew McKay saying we were right to tr uh, begin organizing for the 25th Amendment because we viewed the, uh, Donald Trump as a security problem. Yeah, he's a security problem already. So, 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 so you've got, but where, what, what was the FBI? The FBI played an absolutely important role in, 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 in fomenting the Cold War and keeping the Cold War going. So this is another institution which is part of the old paradigm. So you have the, the military industrial complex and the FBI are part of the old paradigm. And they, and there's, they have to be dealt with. They're going to have to be dealt with in one way or another. But unless Trump can get those jobs in the right places, it ain't going to be dealt with. 
And I think that's very important. Now, so, so now we come to uh, so now we come to a little bit on the conference. Um, Mike went through the, the various panels, and I, I, I will say this. And what Mike described on the second panel about music and science, it, it was that, that's exactly right. And and I'll say this that that um, 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 this conference was very profound, very powerful, and I'm still I still haven't processed it all. And so I'm I'm going to deal with uh, uh, the internal. I'm going to deal with some. Um, the internal aspects of the conference. Uh, we had an internal, and and Mike was uh, was there at the internal, so he got to watch the internal situation. And I didn't know what I was going to what was going to happen. Okay, so <laughs> there are all kinds of realizations that are, were coming to me during the internal and after the internal about the organization that I've been a part of for a long time. You know. Problems that existed, which I never wanted to deal with, wanted to think about, and basically, the movement has been cobbled together and has been, you know, running on, you know, kind of helping held together um, by hook or by crook, but it did not have a, a leadership body, which sat, which co which communicated and. And, and collaborated and del uh, um, deliberated on the intelligence coming in, what was the most effective way to intervene, and do this on a daily basis. We haven't really had that. We had different sections doing different things, which, you know, and Hal was trying to hold it all together, and various other people were trying to hold it all together. But what we came out of the conference was a leadership, a national executive committee, which is responsible to the whole movement, to all of the policy, and they must deliberate every day over the phone, or almost every day over the phone. At some point, they should be meeting to deliberate.